Good to go. One second. Yes, we are live. Okay, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Alvise Armellini. I'm a journalist for the German press agency DPA in Rome, and I am your moderator today for this webinar called uh, Borderline and Transplantation past and present challenges, which is part of the ongoing festival of diplomacy. Uh, this is a, a webinar which aims to show how the uh, Italian National Transplant Center has built over the years an international network to facilitate the exchange of cells, tissues and organs for transplant patients. Uh, it is a network that uh, works, uh, that has um, uh, allowed uh, several life-saving operations, uh, but um, it is a network that has developed um, in, a, in, in various ways, in various international alliances and forms of cooperation. Uh, but the um, aim and the idea is to um, strengthen this, uh, this network, uh, to formalize um, uh, forms of cooperation where they exist or to create one, to create them where um, they do not exist yet and to um, uh, basically um, facilitate uh, all, this, um, uh, all this, this, the, the exchanges that take place under this network. Uh, there are a number of, of challenges uh, that uh, often um, come up uh, within this uh, field, uh, issues related to um, border issues, to uh, translating uh, documentation, uh, logistical challenges, um, issues to do with um, um, accommodation of, of patients and, and, and their families whenever they, they have to travel to, to do their life-saving operations. So um, we would like to uh, share knowledge uh, about uh, this, uh, this situation um, and, uh, and, and highlight how we can, uh, we can do better, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, make it work uh, more um, seamlessly and uh, ultimately work for uh, the aim of, of saving more lives uh, more quickly, more efficiently. Um, which is something that uh, uh, will be for the benefit of everybody. So with, uh, with this in mind, um, I would like to give the floor to Massimo Cardillo, who is our first uh, speaker. He is the director of the Italian uh, National Transport Center based in Bonn. Uh, good morning, uh, Professor Cardillo. Are you Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Do you see me? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? We can hear you very well. Yes. Okay. Yes, we Th do. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we can see you now as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Professor, perhaps you would uh, like to tell us a little bit more how uh, the, the National Transplant Center has uh, built this, uh, this uh, network, this cooperation uh, concerning transplants. Oh, yes. Uh, please, uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, thank the Festival of uh, Diplomacy for this uh, first uh, participation of the National Transplant Center. And so to have the opportunity to discuss with uh, diplomacy professionals, uh, uh, of our uh, uh, cooperational, international cooperational activities uh, with the foreign country, with the, um, the complex uh, donation and uh, transplantation uh, uh, patterns all around uh, Europe. As you can imagine, the transplant system uh, is uh, one of the most complex and articulated uh, network uh, in, uh, in, in medicine, and not only in Italy, but also the other country. There are a lot of uh, professionals involved uh, in this field, uh, a lot of uh, skills and specialties that, that are uh, um, included in the system uh, that create a, a network of interaction 
So uh, the transplant system is, uh, I can say, uh, a model of uh, excellence uh, with few parallels in the, in the pattern of uh, the uh, healthcare. Uh, the architecture of the transplant system uh, in Italy has two main levels, uh, the institutional level and the operational level. Uh, the role of the National uh, Transplant uh, uh, Center is uh, fully integrated with the regional uh, uh, coordinating center in, in our countries. So we work uh, together. We, we uh, will see uh, this also in the today uh, discussion and uh, the main task of the national transplant center is uh, are in particular the monitoring of donation and transplant uh, activity on the in the country the monitoring of the waiting list through the inform informational system the definition of guidelines and uh, operational protocols the allocation of organs that's very important for the national uh, programs. The definition of parameters for the auditing of the quality uh, of the centers and the outcome of uh, the transplant performed and the promotion and the coordination of the relation with foreign institutions in this field. And this is uh, uh, possibly this last point that we will focus in the, today's uh, meeting. This is a very sensitive uh, uh, issue, as you can imagine, because uh, uh, in the last year we have observed uh, a continuously increasing pressure of uh, uh, patients coming from foreign countries uh, to be enrolled on the waiting list uh, in, um, in Italy and in other uh, um, countries with a, a, a good transplantation activity. So uh, one of the um, main tasks for the National Transplant Center was to uh, regulate uh, this uh, request, uh, to regulate them in a way that uh, they can be uh, included inside the principle of uh, Istanbul Declaration on Organ Trafficking. That's a very important point because uh, one of the uh, most important uh, principles of this declaration is that every uh, kind, uh, uh, every country uh, should uh, uh, make all the uh, efforts to get self-sufficiency uh, in uh, organ procurement and transplantation, because no country all around the world has uh, uh, the possibility to uh, guarantee transplant to every patient that need uh, in, uh, in the country because there's a scarcity of uh, organs uh, procured in comparison with the number of patients awaiting on the list. So uh, the National Transplant Center uh, uh, through the years uh, uh, set various bil bilateral agreements between uh, um, it Italy and other uh, European country to, uh, to, to try to regulate uh, this uh, aspect. And uh, uh, we defined uh, some preliminary conditions that uh, uh, are fixed for uh, every foreign non-resident patient that could be evaluated for possible enrollment in Italy, which are these uh, um, conditions. The first is very important that the referral should be done uh, by a national uh, competent uh, authority. And we mean by this the Ministry of Health or a delegated body of the, of the country that is requiring the enrollment of the patient. A declaration of non-availability of the therapy in the patient country of origin. A declaration of uh, uh, availability of post-transplant follow-up in the originating country in a way, in, in a way not to... Uh, to, to, to have a transplant that uh, uh, will have no success in the long term. The declaration of cost coverage uh, for evaluation, transplantation and subsequent health care and the uh, availability of the originating country to offer or return to Italy the organ retrieved from the cadaveric donor that are not utilized in, in the country. 
And this agreement also uh, relates uh, to the training, uh, exchanging of expertise uh, on the caring of uh, patient awaiting a patient transplanted, on the caring of uh, donors uh, procured. So um, the, the main task for us when uh, we are setting this agreement is uh, to um, to make the foreign country develop a system, a system that is uh, uh, complete uh, both in the donor uh, procurement side and, the, uh, and on the transplantation side. Uh, currently, such uh, agreements are in place with some uh, European countries, such as Malta, Greece, uh, Serbia, and some others are uh, also under discussion with Bosnia and uh, Romania. And um, we have also a cooperational uh, agreement through a devoted portal, uh, which is named FIDUS, uh, inside an intergovernmental organization, the South Alliance for Transplant, that allows a systematic exchange of organs uh, with many other countries, uh, such as uh, France, Spain, Switzerland, and, and so on. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic had uh, also a relevant effect not only on donation and transplantation activities uh, all around Europe, both in the first wave and also in the present times. Uh, but the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has also entailed, uh, entailed the new challenges in the international cooperation program. We have a lot of criticism in uh, patient uh, transportation and uh, especially uh, on the side of uh, bone marrow transplant. And I hope that this event could be the opportunity to discuss with the diplomacy professional uh, on the way to face this criticism and uh, possibly to solve them uh, uh, together. Uh, going to the transplantation of uh, hemato hematopoietic stem cells, so bone marrow transplantation, that is the uh, other kind of transplant uh, that uh, uh, the National Transplant Center deals with. Uh, the role of our organ organization is uh, fully defined uh, also on the uh, organizational point of view and the operational point of view, together with the uh, uh, other uh, institution of the network, such as uh, the Italian Group for Bone Marrow Transplantation, and most of all, uh, the Italian Registry of uh, Bone Marrow. And uh, together with uh, these two institutions, uh, we have uh, coordinated, the, uh, coordinated the activity of uh, uh, bone marrow procurement and transplantation in the COVID-19 pandemic, facing a lot of criticism, and we will have the opportunity to discuss some special cases uh, just uh, uh, today, uh, because in uh, the bone marrow uh, transplant, uh, this is especially relevant because we have a lot of uh, exchanges of uh, uh, donor material uh, through European uh, countries and not only European. So this uh, uh, activity was uh, uh, particularly influenced in the period of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, well, I mm, thank you very much for uh, your attention. I, I will uh, uh, close my introduction and uh, hope this uh, uh, will be a very fruitful uh, uh, day for uh, every participant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Cardillo. Perhaps if I could just ask you so that uh, the participants know um, have an idea about the scale of uh, of this uh, of what we're talking about. Um, I understand that in Italy, um, you we have about four thousand transplants every year, but international transplants with international patients. Um, I read that there were only sixteen in two thousand and nineteen. Is that correct? Is that the the correct uh, scale? 
Oh, uh, well, if you consider the transplant uh, in uh, non-resident patient, the numbers are uh, quite low compared to the overall number of the transplant performance. We uh, have about 10%, uh, uh, so a very higher number if you consider uh, uh, the transplant in uh, patient that uh, uh, were born abroad but are uh, president in our country. So it is a, a number that is uh, partially under discussion. So there are different situations. We have patients that are uh, not resident in Italy, but they require access to the waiting list uh, remaining in their country. And we have also patients that come to Italy and they uh, have full residency and then they require transplantation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with that, um, I would like to move on to the next speaker, who is Nicoletta Sacchi of the Italian Registry for Bone Marrow Donors, based in Genoa. Yeah. Doctors, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Okay. So, please um, tell us about your... Tell us about your registry and your work. What, what do you do? Okay. Um, I am the director uh, of the Italian Bone Marrow Donor Registry, uh, which is a, a national institution uh, which takes care of the uh, procurement and the search of unrelated uh, hematopoietic stem cell donors on behalf of uh, Italian patients waiting for a bone marrow transplant, uh, uh, usually leukemia patients or, or very um, severe disease affected patients. And uh, usually uh, we uh, are connected with uh, at least uh, 75 uh, international uh, registries uh, which are doing the same in their country. And we exchange continuously uh, stem cell products uh, from and to Italy. Uh, usually we export uh, uh, at least uh, 100, 150 per year uh, stem cell collected from Italian donors and directed to international recipients and vice versa we import uh, at least uh, uh, 700 of uh, stem cell products from abroad to Italy. What happened uh, in the uh, uh, very recent uh, past? As you certainly know in March uh, we uh, were severely affected by the COVID uh, and uh, at the time, uh, uh, Italy was the only, uh, quite the only European country severely affected. So what happened that uh, the Italian citizens uh, were banned uh, from other countries and uh, a lot of uh, flights directed to and from Italy uh, were cancelled. Uh, so, uh, as we have to import and export stem cell, and uh, usually we use uh, trained couriers uh, coming uh, and going uh, to and from Italy with this stem cell, uh, we had a lot of problem uh, to continue this activity and first of all to guarantee the transplantation for our patients but also for international recipients uh, who had to receive the stem cell from Italy. Uh, so at that point, uh, what we uh, organized, uh, I, we have to say that we found an, an, an exceptional collaboration and cooperation with our partners, with our international partners in other registries. But nevertheless, it was really a challenge to find out a solution to exchange, to continue to import and export in few times the cell, because you can understand that the cell must be delivered as soon as possible after the collection to the recipient. Uh, so, um, first uh, problem was that uh, we couldn't use any more Italian couriers abroad because they were banned and they uh, otherwise uh, had to be submitted to a quarantine of 14 days. It, it was not uh, possible to organize our, our uh, import and export in this way. So, uh, with international partners, we decided to organize, uh, we... Uh, uh, 
learn to be very um, flexible and creative. And we, uh, with other international partners, organized uh, a new system to import and export sell based on handover. So for each uh, um, import and export, we organize several handover depending on the, on the trip and uh, on the uh, traveling of the stem cell. But in particular, we was we were very surprised what happened with the Poland country. But the, the handover, the handover take place exactly at the border between different countries. It depends. It depends on the indication of the registry of the country. So, um, example given uh, with uh, Germany and uh, with uh, Great Britain, we organize uh, two hubs uh, in uh, uh, at the airport where the um, um, health uh, uh, our airport authority uh, supervised the, the endover. So we had an hub in Heathrow in Great Britain and one hub in Frankfurt in, uh, in Germany. And we, vice versa, organized one hub in Rome Fiumicino in Italy. But with Poland, the things were a little bit different because uh, uh, there were no any more uh, um, direct flight connection between Poland and Italy. So to import from Poland, and we usually import uh, one pro product uh, per week. So we have uh, a, a high activity with this uh, registry. Uh, we uh, thought to uh, organize in this way, one courier from Poland to Germany, the second one courier from Germany to Rome Fiumicino, uh, the third one, Italian courier from Rome Fiumicino Airport to the transplant center, which was located in the north of Italy, so by car going to, to Italy. But we were very surprised when we received from the Polish colleagues the instruction where to perform the first handover. They uh, sent us uh, a map with uh, uh, co geographic coordinates uh, saying that uh, the data was in the, exactly in this place, uh, 52 degrees uh, latitude north, seven, uh, 14 uh, degrees longitude east. And this place uh, corresponds uh, to a bridge, uh, a bridge in uh, uh, Slubis. Slubis is uh, a, a little village in Poland uh, divided from uh, through a bridge from Frankfurt on Old. There is uh, a river. And uh, after the Yalta conference, uh, uh, this border was designed uh, in order to divide the east block from the west block. It's and, like a spy uh, story almost. Yes, exactly. In, in, along this bridge in the past, uh, during the Cold War, were exchanged spies. Uh, and we exchanged the stem cell. Uh, during the lockdown, uh, a, a, a new border was established with new um, guard officer for the border. And they helped us to assist uh, our two couriers, so one from Poland and the other one from Germany, to exchange uh, the stem cells. And we continue in this way from uh, uh, March till the end of June, uh, till when the, the regular, more or less, flights from Poland to Italy were again established. But I have to tell you that uh, uh, we are waiting for Polish colleagues uh, information because uh, um, probably in the next uh, week uh, we start again with this procedure because Poland is going to be uh, put in lockdown again. So probably all the flights will be canceled. So what we learned from this lesson, uh, first of all, to be flexible. And uh, we gave an example uh, to the other countries affected uh, one month or one month and a half uh, after uh, our country, how to organize this, uh, this uh, uh, shipment and delivery of the stem cell. The second point was that we found an exceptional collaboration uh, with our colleagues uh, uh, working in the registries in the other country but uh, we had some difficulties in speaking with the embassy officer. I mean, they were very collaborative, but uh, after we could explain them what we are, what we do, uh, and what we need, uh, because uh, 
uh, normally they do not know anything about this change of uh, stem, stem cell, uh, tissue and organ exchange uh, among countries. So it was difficult to find the right person in few time um, whom to speak to, 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 to have assistance in, in the pertinent embassy. Uh, both, I mean, uh, Italian embassies in foreign countries and vice versa, international uh, embassy in Italy. So this is the, the lesson we learned. But this is something that can be improved, certainly. I just wanted to ask you, how much slower is the procedure compared to normal times when you have to go through uh, this, this um, extraordinary system that you have just explained? Uh, we can say that normally we import uh, from Europe from European countries themselves in seven, eight hours, because normally our couriers use flights, normal flights. With the, the lockdown, we, um, th this procedure took also 24 hours, because in some cases, I gave just uh, you just an example, but we did the same from Austria through Italy, through the highway in Brennero Pass or from Switzerland to Italy uh, by car, not by flight. So it took also 20, 24 hours. And uh, yes, obviously it could be a problem for the uh, safety of the cells and the quality of the cells, but we, we do not have any other uh, solution. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately in these times we have to, we have to all, all, everybody has to be creative. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saki. Um, I think now it's um, time for our third speaker, who is um, Dr. Lucia Celesti from the uh, Bambino Gesù Children's Hospital in Rome, um, who will uh, tell us a little bit about uh, a few cases, a few transplantation cases uh, at the hospital, but also tell us how the, uh, the Bambino Gesù, which is a, a center of excellences, excellency for this kind of procedure, um, how the, the hospital is involved um, in this uh, network of cooperation and, uh, and more generally what, uh, what it does. So please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I am Lucia Celesti. I'm a pediatrician and I am responsible of the accoglienza sort of family uh, services area in Bambino Gesù Children's Hospital. Bambino Gesù, just a few numbers to get an idea of what we do. Uh, actually do. Bambino Gesù is a network of pediatric hospital in Lazio region in Italy. Just some numbers. Um, we have about uh, um, 30,000 ordinary admission, admissions each year and more than 2 billion outpatient visits uh, each year. 30% of whom are, comes from are for uh, um, uh, patients, children, who are not resident in Lazio region. Lazio region for non-Italian um, um, is the region around, uh, around Rome. Last year, we had uh, 5,000 um, ordinary admission for non-Italian patients and uh, uh, also uh, 5,000 uh, uh, day hospital and day surgery for non-Italian patients, so a great number. About, about one half of them comes from European country, uh, mainly for, uh, from Eastern Europe uh, countries. The other 50% comes from the different uh, continent of the planet, Asia, Northern and uh, Southern uh, America and Africa. Um, uh, just to have an idea uh, of the number of uh, uh, pediatric uh, uh, transplants performed here in Bambino Gesù, uh, last year we had uh, 26 uh, kidney transplant transplants, 15 heart transplants, 28 liver transplants, only for pediatrics, so obviously, 
and about uh, uh, 180 bone marrow tra transplant. It is a great number, a big number, because we are talking about children. So it's not normal <laughs> that the children is transplanted. Uh, generally, uh, uh, there are congenital diseases and so on. How we are involved? We are involved in a formal and informal uh, way, I would say, with the Centro Nazionale Trapianti, uh, that is our light in, uh, in, this, uh, in this field. Uh, informal communication has, uh, are sometimes as important as formal communication. Um, I don't want to speak particularly about COVID. Uh, um, I want to um, introduce you to some, uh, um, a couple of uh, um, case reports, just to have a practical idea of what can happen. So, so you imagine you are on uh, uh, Christmas Eve, uh, 20, um, some years ago. Uh, Paola Di Ciaccio, my friend in uh, CNT, calls me and the call is followed by a more formal communication by uh, Centro Nazionale Trapianti. A child, Dimitrios, and uh, uh, I precise that I'm telling you um, just a, a happy ending story, stories. Dimitrios, a child Dimitrios needs uh, to be admitted to our hospital in emergency. Dimitrios is a three, year, uh, three years old child, uh, male. Uh, he was always in uh, good health. Um, uh, he lives in Greece, in Athens, in Greece, in good health until November. In November, he had abdominal pain. It was admit, admitted in uh, Athens Hospital, um, where uh, he was diagnosed with a cardiac failure. And uh, um, as a consequence of uh, respiratory insufficiency, he was intubated and uh, put in extracorporeal membrane uh, oxygenation. So Christmas Eve, uh, they ask us for uh, uh, immediate uh, um, admission in our hospital in order to um, a, a cardiac transplantation. Um, the hospital quickly decided to send our ECMO team in Athens uh, with a, a military aircraft to pick it up and bring him here. Lot of procedures were done with Italian authorities and uh, um, our ECMO team was ready to um, leave um, uh, Ciampino uh, airport uh, uh, on uh, the sunrise of, uh, uh, of Christmas. But we forgot to uh, ask for the authorization of the Greek authorities to land. In. We forgot, it was the first time, I mean, we forgot, we didn't ask for the authorization of Greek authorities uh, to land in Athens. Do you imagine sunrise, Christmas, we have to go to save the life of this child, no authorization to land. Um, the authorization of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Greece was done in a very short time. And I have uh, always to thank them uh, because without their help and the collaboration, without the help and collaboration of the diplomatic channels, the small miracle that has been done would have never been, uh, been done. Okay, so, you, did you get the authorization while the military aircraft was already in the air or, or before? Yes, yes. You have okay. to, to know that the problem started on Christmas Eve and the happy ending was on the morning of Christmas. But can, can also imagine that it, uh, it, it was not easy, I mean. Uh, so that the, the challenge I put on your table, on, uh, on the table of the diplomatic, uh, the diplomatists or the um, students that are uh, asking, that, that are uh, hearing us, is that uh, you can, uh, you have to be ready uh, to get life-saving permissions quickly. This was just an example. May I give another example of another situation? Sure, absolutely. So, and okay. but just perhaps you want to finish the happy ending. So, oh, the happy the... ending is that yes, the heart transplant was uh, performed, and Dimitrios uh, is a, a perfect child now. Um, I think he's in Rome now for one of his uh, follow-up uh, controls. Okay, everywhere, every everything went well. 
Uh, thank you to the team, uh, uh, the team job of uh, all of us, uh, uh, doctors in Italy, doctors in Greece, uh, and the diplomatic channels uh, who take this uh, possible. Um, and do I, do I understand he got a special get well soon message from the First Lady of the United States? Yes, uh, now, you know, there are the elections in America, so I wouldn't <laughs> uh, say that. Uh, yes, but the day when Melania, the um, uh, first lady, went uh, here to visit the Bambino Jesus in, uh, here in um, our hospital, and she met the Pope in the afternoon, uh, uh, she had a visit of the hospital, she met uh, Dimitrios, uh, and uh, in the evening, uh, uh, the new of the heart arriving uh, was given uh, to us and also to Melania, uh, who was flying uh, in uh, the, what's the, what's the name of the aircraft of uh, the president? Uh, Air Force One. Air Force, Air Force One. Force One. Yes. Okay. I have to say that it was given at the same time on Air Force One and uh, <laughs> to Bambino Gesù Hospital and Dimitrios, yes. It was uh, really a happy ending story. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> the second child uh, is a female, Maria Eugenia. And here we're talking about not a heart transplant, uh, but uh, a liver transplant. Uh, this was a child of uh, seven, seven months old with a biliary atresia. She, had, uh, she was suffering from the birth, jaundice, poor growth, uh, feeding uh, difficulties. And uh, in this case, uh, um, the problem was uh, um, she stayed uh, longer, a long time with us uh, in, uh, in Italy. Uh, the, need of, uh, the need for translation of clinical do records, documents, in order to obtain the S2 model. The S2 model is uh, the model needed by hospital to be paid by another state. So for us, the most important thing obviously is saving life, but, but we also have to get the money to sub, sub, sub sustain all that. And uh, the problem was uh, that the consulate in Rome declared uh, itself only responsible for the authentication of the clinical reports, not for the translations. Um, the patients were a bit lost in this process um, and of which the Greek authorities were often uh, not, uh, not aware. And uh, I have always to say that our hospital is provided with uh, a cultural mediation service that is, uh, is active in uh, our hospital. But not all the hospital are provided with uh, uh, a cultural mediation services. So for this case, uh, um, the problem, the challenge I put on your table, uh, I put on the table of the consulate embassies is uh, that one of being able, being able to support their citizens, both in the translation of clinical documents, clinical report that is absolutely necessary. For example, we have translations. We, we are um, authorized as doctor to write in Italian and in English, but we don't speak uh, Greek or other different languages. And also uh, to support uh, um, citizens, their citizens for any need uh, in cultural mediation. That is obviously very important uh, to, to, to live in another countries. Do I have time for a third uh, ex short example or not? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Uh, third one, very quick, very quickly. Um, this is an um, 11 um, years old uh, child, Thomas, from Greece. Um, and uh, this is uh, this, uh, this this child uh, had, uh, has a, had a chronic renal failure. Um, was a child in uh, peritoneal dialysis. Um, he has a, was affected by polycystic kidney. Um, he had no living donor. Um, he was supposed to have, to have but uh, uh, at the end of the story, he had no living donor. So that uh, he had to stay, also this uh, children has to stay um, uh, for years, for a long time in, uh, in Italy. 
and uh, was discharged with the need to stay close to the hospital, stay uh, here in Italy, um, because uh, uh, of the follow-up uh, controls that he had to, to perform. In this case, the hospital had to take charge of a lot of uh, management problems that would normally not be its responsibility, the responsibility, I mean responsibility of the hospital, uh, logistic problems. Uh, uh, for example, the first accommodation house, uh, a roof <laughs> to live uh, to live in uh, food uh, because uh, the father of this child lost his job in uh, in Greece. The mother had to stay here. The family has to stay here. And another big problem was that one of payment of drugs um, uh, outside of the hospital because the drugs when you are inside the hospital are done uh, without fee uh, from uh, the hospital. But normally for Italian patients outside of the hospital, the drugs are provided by national service. Um, uh, in this case, uh, um, uh, the, um, the problem was solved by the help of the Centro Nazionale Trapianti and Greek authorities and Italian authorities also um, with a strong collaboration. But uh, um, the last third and last challenge I uh, put again on the table is uh, that it is very important to think about and to know that a problem can be the help with all non-hospital needs as accommodation, food, and for the supply of non-hospital drugs for citizens of another country. All these problems are aggravated by COVID situation, but are present also in normal times. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you. for your intervention. Very, very exhaustive and very interesting. Um, we now uh, move on to Dr. Giuseppe Feltrin, who is the um, transplantation coordinator in the Veneto region in the northeast of Italy. Um, he will be um, talking to us about the work that the Veneto region does uh, in terms of transplantations. Uh, I understand mainly with um, countries uh, from, uh, with patients uh, from countries from Southeastern Europe, from the Balkans. Um, and he will uh, give us a few uh, examples and some case histories. So. Dr. Feltrin, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Let me first of all thank uh, Dr. Massimo Cardillo, who gave us uh, this opportunity to represent uh, uh, the great uh, work done by Veneto Region in order to support uh, foreign patients to, to, be, to be taken care of uh, in our region. Veneto has a long-standing tradition, both in the field of transplantation. We have uh, 10 uh, transplant centers. Uh, we do both pediatric and adult, uh, and adult organ transplantation of all organs. Uh, we are around uh, five, uh, 500 transplants per year. And then the, lo the long-standing tradition also in terms of reception uh, of and welcome of uh, foreign patients. So consider that uh, we started with uh, a program for extra UE patients uh, in 2001, a program which is fully financed by uh, a part of the national allotment, uh, which is destined to our region for healthcare services. From 2010 uh, to this year, we have served over 700 patients for coming from UE, as I said before, and uh, in just in this year, all, although with all these difficulties related to COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are still working with this program. And also for this year, this program was financed by our, our region with 500,000 uh, 500, euros. In the last four years, we have decided to exclude from this, finance, from this program transplant recipients because they have other channels to be supported and this was just done with the idea to implement uh, the fund uh, in order to, to take care of a patient with uh, non-transplant diseases. Well, as far as transplantation is concerned, uh, we just to give you some numbers, in the last uh, four years, starting from Jan January uh, 2017, we have included uh, 
in our waiting list 25 uh, patients coming from, just give an example, from uh, uh, Croatia, Greece, uh, Kosovo, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbska. Okay, and these patients were, were both adult and pediatric patients. And these patients were recipient of uh, liver, kidney, kidney and pancreas, uh, heart. And uh, so of all, of almost all kinds of organs. We also have uh, an agreement through the National Transplantation Center with Greece for lung, uh, potential lung uh, recipients. Talking about real life, uh, as my colleagues have done, I just want to give you some examples because uh, the main uh, complexity of uh, having these patients inside with our waiting list uh, comes from logistics. But uh, logistics can be very different and the complexity can be very different and it's uh, strongly related to the kind of organ that we are transplanting and to the clinical history of our patients. I know all of you are not doctors, but I think you can follow me in this uh, example. Let's think about, for example, a kidney transplant recipient. This is a patient who usually is uh, clinically stable at home who can wait for the transplantation staying at home. And you know that the substitute for kidney transplantation is the usage of dialysis. So this patient can remain at home. And uh, when we have a call for him, uh, we have uh, a lot of, uh, of facilities to call him. Why? Because uh, the patient is stable first uh, and because uh, the organ kidney is permissive. In fact, you have to know that when we deal with a kidney transplantation, we have what we call the ischemic time. And the ischemic time for kidney transplantation is of around a maximum of 12, 14 hours. What does it mean? It means that from a moment in which I harvest the kidney from my donor, I have 12 hours before starting the transplantation in my recipient. So if we imagine one of our recipients coming from uh, Croatia, Serbia, whatever you want, he, has, uh, he should have the time enough uh, to drive his own car and in seven, eight hours by the call being here. But consider that this call is always done in the night. So we usually wake up our recipient in the heart of the night. And this makes a great difference. Just because if you think that coming here to Padova by car from uh, whatever country, uh, Croatia, Serbia, I told you, can take seven hours, it's fully different if you do this travel. It's this, the, the recipient does this travel alone during summer with all the, the roads clean. And if he has to do, to do the, same, the same trip in winter with uh, no snow, wind, and whatsoever. In these cases, of course, even if we have some room, some time, we would like to have a institu an institutional counterpart in order to support the pa this patient to come here with uh, an ambulance, a professional driver, not to run the risk of putting this patient into a, ra a rush, which can be harmful, not only for himself, himself but also for the caregiver. So for all those who are accompanying him to this trip, uh, to make, uh, to make us our, our uh, organ transplantation. Just to give you an example of uh, the fact that this is reality, tonight I spent some hours at the phone trying to arrange a flight, a flight uh, a travel, which was a private flight tra travel for a potential recipient um, for a lung transplantation. This patient was coming from Calabria, so 1,000 kilometers from, uh, from far from here, and we were able to call the patient and have the patient here in less than four hours. You mean, you, you understand the disease logistics, the disease what uh, Dr. Khalid Cardillo has described before as the, our Italian network, but this is something that we need in general, not only for our national, national recipients. Of course, as I told you before, the more complex the clinical case is uh, the more the logistics get, gets complex and the other example I want to give you is uh, just from the heart I am an heart surgeon also, and uh, so I give you this uh, this uh, this example of when we deal with uh, uh, what we call life-saving organs which are lung heart uh, 
uh, lever, we have fully different scenario with different with shorter times to have the patient here in us in our hospital when we call him with shorter times to perform transplantation and with the fact that which is absolutely unpredictable that these patients can get unstable when they are on their waiting list at home and so with the potential need as you said from lucia as you heard from lucia before of having the need to go to the patient's home and bring the patient to the center for urgent transplantation. The example I want to give you is of a young, uh, young guy, seven years old, that we, uh, which had uh, for coming from Greece, uh, that we listed for, for our transplantation. When, we all, when this all started, we knew we had to evaluate, to assess a patient, uh, to understand if he was a good candidate for heart transplantation and uh, that this patient was stable at home. So just uh, uh, in December, the, the young baby came here with their mother with the idea that in, then, that in 10 days, we would have uh, understood if it was transplantable or not. And with the idea of sending him back home uh, in order to wait for the call for transplantation. As soon as, he came, as soon as he came here, it was quite clear to us all that he was absolutely unstable. And so in, uh, in some days, in less than 10 days, we assisted to a pro pro progressive escalation of, of our medical approach. So it started in a general ward, in a cardiology, in a cardiology bed. And after 10 days, it was in an ICU bed, in an intensive care unit bed. And uh, in less than 20 days, it was necessary to switch this patient from uh, his art to a, an artificial art. And the patient has waited for the art and the art arrived one year after. So in, during this period, the, the young baby has remained for all the time in our intensive care unit. And uh, I think you can imagine, but if you can't, I tell you how complex it was then when we had uh, an available donor for him to go to transplantation and now many complications we have to face uh, after transplantation for a patient who was so weak uh, because of his very prolonged hospitalization. So it took uh, us also after the transplantation, he didn't go back home in 20 days as it usually happen, happens with the normal transplant, cardiotransplant recipients. But uh, I don't want to talk about, uh, I, I've given you the clinical scenario, but uh, just to give, you, to give you this example, to tell you that uh, it's not only a matter of uh, economics, of reimbursement. Uh, uh, usually when we get a patient from abroad, we don't have problems about concerning reimbursement. Uh, we have uh, institutional channels. And it, this is never a problem. Usually it's not a problem. It's not only, not, not only a clinical problem, this is our job, we know what to do when we do it, okay. But what I like to, I just show you this example to talk to you once again about the social burden, burden of the transplantation. Let's get back, get back to the history of the patient, okay. After 10 days, the mom of this young baby calls her husband, who is still in Greece, is working in Greece with another another young ch child. And she said, things are getting worse here. Please come here and support me. And we all know how it is important to uh, uh, rebuild the family integrity when we are dealing with these complex cases, because we all know of the uh, um, devastating effects that these cases have within, uh, within a family. So the father and the, the young guy left Greece and they came here, okay? And when, they came, and when they came here, they had no job. The father lo lost the job. They, the, other, the other brother didn't have the possibility to go to school. They had book and hotel, but on, not an house. Okay. And so we, together with our volunteers, has, uh, had to take care of this call. And this is uh, all the social sphere, the social sphere concerning an uh, organ transplantation. Just to tell you that uh, we have to try to support this family, and we, do that, we did our best to do it, and we were successful in this. Just to tell you that uh, 
when we think about transplant transplantation, it is not only a matter of reimbursement of organs uh, or whatsoever, but it's something more complex. It's something that can be can have a, a devastating power in a, within a, within a family. So, um, if I should have a wish, if I could have a wish, once again, I think, and, and in this I agree with uh, Lucia in her presentation before, we really need to have an, institution, an institutional counterpart that takes into consideration the social burden of transplantation, which is something that goes absolutely beyond the, the clinical issue of transplantation. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you, so when the uh, patients who have to drive themselves to, to, to get a transplantation, do they have problems at the borders? Did you have uh, greater problems during the lockdown period? Do you have any uh, examples I thank of you. that? I thank you for, the quest, for this question. Well, uh, usually uh, we didn't have problems, especially with the kidney recipients. Now we have. Sometimes it happens, it happened just some days ago that we called a patient for transplantation and we have issues because when he came to the board, to the, our border, of course, he had to face the restriction of his original countries and of our country. So in the heart of the night, once again, we had to prepare some very quick documents to unblock the patient and let the patient come to our office. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that also this, uh, this issue is something that should be a little bit more, let me say, institutional, institutionalized. I mean, we need to have a channel which is a very clear channel in the way that, in the way that we don't miss time. Because when we do this call, it's quite clear that we don't, we don't, we don't have time to do it. So sometimes it's, uh, it's difficult to face these issues. Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. And just uh, to, to, to do the same as was done with, um, with uh, Lucia Celesti, you can assure, you, assure us that there was a happy ending in that uh, heart slump, uh, transplant story. Uh, there was, there was, but it, it was a very, very long uh, and complex history. There was. And so, and you confirm that Veneto mainly works with countries such as uh, Greece, Serbia, uh, sort of Greece, Balkans. Yes, uh, Greece, uh, Croatia, uh, Croatia, for example, mainly for uh, pediatric kidney recipients. Uh, Kosovo, in one case, Bosnia, Rep Republika Serba of Bosnia Herzegovina, mainly with these countries and with this uh, agreement with Greece. This is our main area. I think this is mainly due also to geographical reasons because of course you can understand that for people coming from Croatia and Bosnia doesn't take so much time to, to get to Veneto through the border. Okay, okay, Dr. Petri, so thank you very much. Now um, we um, have our next speaker. Um, if um, that's, that's a slight change in the order of the speakers. Um, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, His Excellency Goran Aleksic, the Serbian ambassador to Italy. If uh, uh, the following speaker, who is uh, Dr. Arnon Nagler uh, from the China Shiba Medical Center in Israel, uh, agrees uh, to let uh, Ambassador Alexic speak before him because I think he has uh, an engagement and needs to uh, to speak earlier. Uh, so apologies for this uh, change of schedule and I give the floor to Ambassador Alexic. If he's with us. Hello, to, can you hear me? We can. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello to everybody. Thank you for inviting me for this webinar. I'm, I'm of course, uh, not an expert. I'm not a medical doctor, but I could give you in a nutshell what Serbia, how Serbia and Italy are cooperating and what the embassy is doing in, the, in this field. Uh, I think that one of the most uh, fruitful cooperations in the field of, uh, of uh, health is in the area of transplantation. 
Uh, we, we signed with Italy different agreements uh, starting from 2018. We started, signed first a protocol um, um, on cooperation in, uh, in the field of uh, donation and transportation of the organs. Then in 2019, we signed a technical protocol. Um, then we had uh, the, the visit of our Minister of Health here and we, we met the, the, the people from the Italian National Transportation Center. Then we had the honor to have uh, the, the director of the, of the center, uh, Dr. Massimo, Massimo Cardillo uh, in Belgrade. And uh, I think that uh, this, uh, uh, this cooperation is intense and fruitful. Uh, there are a lot of, um, lives uh, saved and uh, families made uh, happy uh, due to this, uh, um, I would say, efficient cooperation. Uh, I would like to, to just uh, give you uh, the, 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 the perspective, the embassy perspective, how it goes, because you're one of your previous speakers mentioned uh, difficult technical problems. So, Usually, the, the, our hospital will contact the hospital. For example, we have an excellent cooperation with the um, hospital in Bergamo, uh, Papa Giovanni XXIII. And so usually the hospitals uh, get uh, direct contact. After that, uh, um, our hospital will contact the embassy and the embassy will do, uh, will do its work. I mean, we, we then, due to this COVID crisis and uh, everything is, uh, is more complicated. So we will contact Farnesina and uh, tell who, who and why is coming. Uh, then we will wait for the um, green light of the, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and of the Ministry of Health. Then in Belgrade, the, 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 usually this uh, Young kids are, are, are accompanied with the, with the mother or with the father. So we have to provide the tests that they are, that they are healthy. And uh, after that, we have to uh, contact the, the, the authorities and uh, make possible the landing. So we have to have the authorization for the landing. Usually this is, uh, in our case, it is a, a governmental uh, flight. Uh, it's, a, it's a plane small plane from the government of Serbia. So after getting this permission, then we will uh, contact the, the, the border police, um, the, the Polizia di Frontiera. We had an excellent cooperation, for example, with the Polizia di Frontiera in Bergamo. So they will usually uh, wait for this uh, flight, a special flight. They will provide assistance. They will, uh, they will help uh, uh, to, um, uh, I would say, to overcome these all um, necessary procedures in the uh, airport. And uh, uh, they will uh, or accompany or they will uh, uh, give instructions for the drivers to where, where, where to go. So it is not, it is not easy. It is, uh, uh, it is a thing that it has to be organized well. As a uh, as, uh, previous speaker uh, mentioned, we don't have a, a unlimited uh, period of time in these in this cases. So uh, this is the, 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 in a nutshell, uh, how, how it goes. We, we had the, the, the privilege to have the Italian, the Italian uh, delegation visiting uh, Belgrade, uh, speaking uh, how to enhance their cooperation. Uh, Dr. Cardillo was, was there. He met with Professor Chulafic, who is our leading expert. Um, we then uh, um, had a, a cooperation even uh, um, in this, uh, try to help each other in this COVID, uh, COVID crisis. Uh, we had a team of medical experts from Italy in Belgrade. Uh, sharing their uh, uh, knowledge and thoughts on how to help and how to prevent the, the disease. From Serbia, there was a, a, 
a big shipment of uh, medical equipment uh, to Italy as a, as a guest of, of or guest, uh, as a sign of friendship. So, uh, in a general, generally, the, the, the cooperation uh, of, of Serbia and Italy uh, in this field is excellent. And one of my first tasks when I came here in Rome in 2017 was to uh, give a helping hand in a, in a transplantation, lung transplantation of a, of a um, professor uh, of medical uh, faculty uh, who came here uh, and he was operating, uh, operated in, in Italy. So uh, from, um, I, I, I would like to say that the, the embassy here in Belgrade is very, um, I would say, uh, engaged when we have this kind of, of cases because there are a lot of, a lot of uh, steps to be done, technical steps to be done uh, in order to have this smooth, um, uh, I would say, um, transition from uh, Belgrade or one of the uh, uh, towns in Serbia to, to Italy or one of the uh, uh, excellent centers uh, that are, uh, that are uh, working here in Italy. So that would be uh, uh, in a nutshell and that would be my view uh, on, this, on this issue. Pastor, thank you very much for, for your intervention. So we now go to Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now go to Dr. Nagle, uh, who is director of hematology and bone marrow transplantation at the Chaim Sheba Medical Center in Israel. And I understand that Dr. Nagle will be um, also showing some slides. So please, Dr. So thank you for the kind invitation. Yeah, thank you for the kind invitation uh, to this important uh, diplomacy festival, and uh, I'm honored to be with uh, uh, all these uh, prestigious Italian colleagues. Doctor, and if I, I can uh, just, I can just sorry to interrupt you. If you can just perhaps adjust your camera because uh, we cannot see you see you properly. Here, thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Yes, okay. thank you. So I will talk about borderline and transplant the past, present challenge, and I'm from the Division of Hematology and Bone Marrow Transplantation and Cellular Therapy. I'm also Vice Chair of the Acute Leukemia Working Party of the ABMT. So if can, I can have the first slide, it's not moving. So just to tell you about uh, our hospital, so we are for the second year in a row, are uh, elected as uh, uh, among the 10 uh, best uh, hospital, uh, according to the survey on the Newsweek, and the story in the right for the Hebrew, but we are ranked number one in Israel. If we talk about bone marrow transplantation, everything starts with uh, the Donald Thomas, that uh, is the pioneer of the transplant from Hetz Hutchinson in Seattle and received the Nobel Prize. And we have another novelist here, which is uh, Professor Dosser for the HLA. We can see here George Maté from France that uh, started in the 50s after uh, accidents radiation accident, the transplant, Van Rood from, uh, from uh, Holland that compete for the Nobel Prize for HLA, Robert Good for transplanting children in SCID, and uh, Paul Tarazaki for the HLA conference. So right from the beginning, you can see that the transplantation is uh, all about cooperation between here European and, uh, and American uh, countries. And for this cooperation, I choose the, the, this leaflet of the bone marrow donor worldwide, uh, uh, claiming that BMT is unique in that international collaboration is essential to provide the best possible donor for every patient, as we heard in this uh, diplomacy festival all morning. And indeed, there are uh, few international, European, and American organizations 
to make this happen. This is the European bone marrow transplantation, the international bone marrow transplant, the American bone marrow transplantation, the national bone marrow program, the clinical international bone marrow transplantation, the Euro code, so change of uh, core blood banks, and the Asia Pacific. So all we are a, a small village to help in uh, cure and save the life of our patients. And all this chain of unrelated donors gives us the uh, opportunity to uh, find a donor for almost every patient that need because transplant is the way to cure and prolong life of many of the patients according to this publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. Only a minorities that are listed here, it's uh, about 12%, it's difficult to find. And uh, all this session is also about these minorities you know that the biggest registry in the world is focusing now to find donors also to increase the possibility or chance to find the donor for the minorities as well. If we look on the activity of transplantation across uh, Europe and uh, uh, over the Atlantic, we can see that most of the transplant are done from this donor registry volunteers that gain, uh, have no gain for donating a bone marrow or peripheral blood for transplantation. You can see here the unrelated adult donor transplantation in the state and in the Europe. We can see here two types of family transplant. One is from sibling, HLMH sibling, and the other one that is increasing now, especially also in the COVID-19 time, is a half match of HLA between a uh, family donor, so a uh, 50% HLA match, a uh, mother, father, children, or brother. And then the unrelated core blood that was less attractive uh, last years, but have the advantage in the COVID-19 pandemic because this is a frozen unit that can reach you before the transplant or you have in your bank. And we heard uh, uh, from previous speakers, the huge difficulties of shipping and the operation to shipping a donor in this time. And searching a donor, we will not go into it, but it's very complicated and every transplant center have a donor uh, searcher or don position. And they, we are communicating on a daily basis with actually all the donor registries and many times or in every country of the world. For instance, we are getting now shipment of a donor for the first time from Turkey. Uh, we get from India and not just from a Western world country or the United States. And I'm happy that I, I have these slides because this story was uh, detailed uh, in, uh, in very detail by uh, Professor Nicoletta Sachi uh, in the second talk. But this is exactly the problem of the liver of the, of the uh, bone marrow graft or peripheral blood graft between uh, Hamburg and the Polish border, you heard, and these are the countries in red that you can, that are blocked, the boundaries, and the way that the delivery uh, by hand had to uh, go through the bridge in order to, to uh, that this graft will manage to get to the patient and save his life. And uh, uh, my, one of my famous colleagues from the States tweet that getting the right product into the right patient from anywhere in the world, not just from the US to US. As a clinician, I think that it is a perfect example of something that happened routinely. I don't even think about it, that the product is not going to arrive on time. So this is our daily life, but now it's much more challenging. So we already discussed the type of transplant. This is the tra uh, transplant that you give your a patient give to himself, the bone marrow, but this is only if he's in remission with no disease. This is a rare type of transplantation between twin. And we already talked about the unrelated, which can be mismatch, related core blood and haploidentical transplant with uh, the core blood and haploidentical uh, advantage as a source of graph uh, in the COVID time and when there is an uh, epidemic area and uh, lockdown, uh, so we can move to this graft in order to save the life of our patient. And this is because we are in uh, Italian colleagues. This is from William Marcece, 
my good friend and colleague uh, for many years I established the Rome network of uh, seven centers for transplantation. And just to see the, to see the option and to see that he's giving a pre-transplant uh, therapy, the same for all the patient, but only change. This is the same thing for brother and sister, unrelated cobla transplant and haploidentical transplant. He just changed the immunosuppression post-transplantation so all this network, now national network, are working with the same protocol, the same philosophy, and the same uh, idea. So we can uh, now uh, analyze the data uh, uh, more uh, efficiently. Number of transplants around the world. So we have basically about 50,000 uh, transplants a year. Out of them, 35,000 are autologous and 15,000 allogeneic. So we are talking about big numbers. This is not a one, two patients. This is a, a very large scale operation. And the, most of these patients uh, would be with, not with us, us, and uncurable with our transplantation. And we see here again the number uh, with the unrelated transplant at the top. Also important that we are talking about patients uh, that are not 18. We know that the COVID-19 uh, is increased in chance in age and also increase uh, with the severity and the results uh, and the recovery uh, go down. And we can see that um, uh, about third of our patients that we are transplanting today are above the age of 60. So in the risk group of the COVID-19, and also we have increased the number of patients that we are transplanting about the age of 70. So challenging time. We can do the transplant in this uh, patient. And this is also very important for the COVID-19 by giving the patient less myeloablative and less strong conditioning without radiation and is very basing the transplant on immunotherapy and not a uh, and not uh, heavy, uh, heavy uh, uh, TBI or uh, intense chemotherapy. And this is for another a friend of uh, Italian, very famous transplanter, Professor Bacigalupo, that met uh, in Genoa, uh, near Bambino Hospital now, uh, previously in Milan, and he needs no introduction. And this is again very important in the COVID-19 time because we cannot give the patient myeloablative conditioning because if we give myeloablative conditioning and the patient turn on a COVID-19 positive a week or two weeks later, the chance that he will survive this event are very low. So with the reduced intensity conditioning, the patient hardly have a reduction in the count or what we call pancytopenia and this is uh, our recommendation in the uh, consensus papers that we wrote and are available how to transplant patients in the COVID-19 pandemic era. And by doing this, uh, uh, we, the transplanter uh, could reduce by 50% the mortality and organ toxicity at transplantation. This is the work published in New England Journal of Medicine from Seattle. You can see that the two decades and in the most recent decade, by the using the reduced intensity conditioning, the toxicity and mortality of transplant went down drastically. Now I will bring into the scene another very popular immunotherapy these days, which is the CAR T cell. So this is immunotherapy, cellular immunotherapy. The CARs are genetically engineered fusion protein and what the antigen recognition domain is, uh, is driven from a monoclonal antibody, and then you have the singling domain. And by doing this, the CAR T cell can recognize, uh, the T cells transduced with the CAR uh, vector, can recognize and attack the tumor direct directly without HLA presentation. So we have now uh, two commercial products that are approved, as you know, for CAR T cell. One is the Chimeria, approved for uh, children uh, up to the age of 25 with acute lymphatic leukemia and for a uh, lymphoma patient. And another one is Iscarta from lymphoma patients. And we and Shiba have our academic CAR T cells that is 
uh, is produced in-house and we don't need to ship the cell. And this is also very uh, attractively in the COVID-19 time, you can see here the activity in Sheba according to the EBMT centers. This is when we started in 2016, our CAR academic trial in uh, how it's registered. We have a program for both non-Hodgkin lymphoma and acute lymphatic leukemia. And we treated by now 150 patients. And this is a celebration, the leaflet of a celebration we did in September 2019 for our first in-house academic CAR T-cell therapy. And this also is a cooperation between many other countries because we get patients from all over the world and from Italy as well. And this is also an alternative for transplantation at all and in especially in the COVID-19 time. So what are the challenging and what are the competition of transplant? This is adoptive cellular immunotherapy uh, and CAR T cells is leading this uh, competition for the benefit of the patients. So I would conclude saying that allogeneic hemopoietic cell transplantation and adoptive cell mediated immunotherapies are the ultimate example of international collaboration that is based on efficient logistical and organizational aspects that are especially challenging in the COVID-19 pandemic. And would like to thank you and uh, take any question if need. Thank you. Dr. Nagle, thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, we do have one question from the audience. I'm not sure who it is addressed to, but uh, please, Arman Mulic, uh, you have the floor. Hello, everybody. Um, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, massive thanks to all the panelists and to the moderator, Mr. Armelini, for a very fascinating and eye-opening um, discussion. Um, my name is Arman Molic and I'm a global governance student at the University of Rome Torvergata from Bosnia and Herzegovina, actually. And um, my question will kind of follow the, let's say, the general picture, um, taking into consideration the various challenges and issues that all of the panelists have mentioned. So from tracing transplants from a donor to recipient and then this lack of cultural competence in our health systems that, that was mentioned by uh, Ms. Celesti, I think. And then the, the whole coronavirus pandemic slowing down um, the, the system. Um, I was just curious because we have many medical professionals here today. I was just curious to hear their take on how the policymakers and governments can support this international cooperation and establish a a more accessible global supply of tissues, cells and organs in general. Um, yeah, thank you very much and I hope I was clear. Okay, is there one of the panelists who specifically wants to answer this? How policy makers... I, I, I can uh, try to answer this question because uh, as you can imagine, the uh, European uh, institutions, such as uh, European Committee and the uh, European uh, Council, uh, have faced the question of uh, uh, products of human origin uh, in, in front of the situation of the pandemic under uh, several point of view. Uh, the first one is uh, to assess measures to uh, guarantee the exploitation of uh, donation and transplantation activity uh, in this era, uh, to guarantee transplant uh, in, uh, in safety all uh, around the European countries. And with the task to harmonize uh, the measures in several uh, European countries to face the pandemic. So, uh, in Italy, especially, we have uh, faced this uh, aspect with uh, two different uh, ways. The first one is uh, to give indication to uh, Italian region that uh, donation and transplantation activity is an essential level of assistance. So uh, it should be guaranteed even in the course of the pandemic. So uh, hospital have to uh, identify solution 
to keep uh, this activity alive uh, because as you can imagine the uh, facing of, of the pandemic entails uh, the uh, an effort of the intensive care units uh, with the covid positive patient and, and this effort probably in some cases uh, can decline the attention for procurement activity so uh, this is the first indication the second is uh, to uh, foresee um, covid uh, free pathway for uh, patient on the waiting list and transplanted patient because as you can imagine uh, the transplanted patient is a very frail uh, patient because he, he is immunosuppressed, so uh, he is uh, at more uh, risk of uh, infection. And uh, in the case of infection, there is also a higher risk of mortality. So you have to uh, prepare a, a defined pathway, a COVID-free pathway for those patients. And, uh, uh, European authorities uh, uh, gave also indication for the um, for all the participant uh, countries to, to to give indication that sense. Okay, professor. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question from the audience. Um, I cannot see the name fully, but it's a question from Tuishime. Perside, please. Yes, thank you very much. I am Perside. I'm in the second year of global governance, Tor Vergata. And uh, I'll start by saying thank you to all the institutions uh, working together to provide not only medical facilities, but also other facilities for a comfortable environment for a patient who need transplantation. I have a question for uh, Dr. Lucia. Uh, you told us that the numbers of children who uh, need transplantation and they are high, of course, and considering the processes those kinds of patients have to go through for transplantation, they really take time and some people might lose their lives on the way, especially uh, for people who have to move from one country to another. So my question is, are there any specific reason causing, reasons causing the increase in of numbers of children who need transplantation? Uh, just, uh, I need an answer uh, as a person who has, who is working in a medical field. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, thank you for your, your question. Uh, it is the it is the truth. Uh, we the, the problem we're facing is to um, cannot solve uh, uh, life saving uh, problems. Um, one of the first question I put on uh, the table is uh, the necessity, the need for you uh, who are young, who are student, uh, to know very well uh, that uh, you have to take decision quickly. Uh, because in these fields, uh, um, to be able to um, take a quick decision can really save a life. Uh, working in, um, I can make this example, working uh, um, uh, with transplants is uh, quite similar to working in an emergency department. Uh, you have to uh, choose you have uh, to be able uh, to do a triage, I mean, to understand very quickly which are the red code patients and uh, which kind of patients uh, can, uh, can wait, instead can wait, uh, as um, the, the other speakers uh, told uh, better than me uh, before, before me. Uh, you have to do this kind of choices. I have to say that uh, with uh, the strict, um, the strong uh, um, cooperation of National uh, Transplant Health Center, uh, we, uh, I, I think we, we did not um, lose patients. Um, almost all our stories uh, have uh, an happy ending. Um, and uh, this is due not only, as I said before, to formal col collaboration that are necessary and obviously uh, we, we have to work on, but also on not formal communications that are very important. And I think that this is another thing that we have to take in mind. Um, do for you that you, you are young, 
um, do not limit your activity to what is uh, formal, but uh, uh, try to do uh, every day uh, a step more. Uh, think about the things uh, that uh, can happen uh, because uh, um, you can, you will, you will, maybe you will face what we faced on Christmas. Um, something new, uh, something you don't don't know don't know don't know before, and uh, the sensation of solving such a problem is uh, something uh, really great. I don't know if I answer it. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Celesti. Um, I think we have nearly run out of time, uh, but uh, I would like to give the floor back to Director Cardillo for some concluding remarks and also ask him if he can to um, tackle a couple of questions that came through the web. I'm gonna read them now. Uh, the first one is, would it be useful to create a network of professionals from international institutions, competent authorities and diplomacy that would supervise, manage and support all exchanging process involving both patient waiting uh, involving patients waiting for a transplant and tissue and cells. And the second question is, would it be possible to build up a dedicated border corridor for tissue and cells couriers, as well as dedicated procedures to facilitate patients traveling to the transplant country? Okay. Thank you very much for these two important suggestions. Uh, I, I think that uh, we had an overview of the complexity of the system, and, and I think that these two suggest suggestions could be very help helpful to have a step forward uh, uh, to, to face this uh, uh, criticism that we had in this uh, special period, but more in general, to, uh, to face uh, the, the complex uh, uh, problem of international uh, cooperation in the field of organ donation and, uh, and transplant. Uh, I, I think I, I just uh, took some notes of, of the uh, items that were uh, discussed, and I think that this uh, uh, has been an opportunity to, to have uh, kind of uh, uh, sharing on that. Uh, we have talked about the logistic. Logistic is a, a very important uh, challenge because uh, we are uh, used to, to face the health problem when we speak about the patients requiring uh, transplantation. But uh, in most cases, the health problem is not the, uh, the most important one, as Dr. Feltrin said. Uh, we have we have seen uh, what uh, uh, kind of relevance uh, can have the social burden for the families of uh, patients uh, uh, requiring access to uh, transplant in a foreign country. I think that uh, uh, the constitution of uh, an international group uh, that include also the diplomacy uh, personnel and professionals can can help to face the social burden that uh, uh, families have, have, to, uh, have to pass uh, when requiring this therapy in a, in a different country. The other very important issue is the involvement of competent authority. I think that we, we, we cannot forget that we uh, cannot be alone to give an answer to the patient and the family if there is not uh, a, a real involvement of the competent authority of the foreign country requiring the therapy. Because uh, this is, in, especially in the, in the donation and transplantation field, because we have to remember that uh, there is, uh, uh, um, it is mandatory that every country uh, all around the world uh, try to, to reach the self-sufficiency in organ donation and transplant. So this is very important to be, uh, to be uh, confirmed. So the competent authority should be uh, motivated to face uh, the transplantation demand of their own country to reach self-sufficiency. 
Italian transplant system is a system of, uh, of excellence, so it is very attractive in this uh, period for patients from other countries, but there is a need of, uh, or, of regulation. So the constitution of uh, an international group can help also in that, uh, in that sense. Uh, last, uh, I, I think that uh, we have, have to face uh, uh, the number. As you said before, uh, we are talking about 1% uh, of the overall transplant activity that is dedicated to patients coming from other countries. But if we consider the number of, of patients uh, uh, that were born abroad and required transplantation uh, being resident in Italy, the number reached about 15% of the overall activity. And in most of these cases, we are talking about patients that uh, doesn't speak our language, that uh, uh, have difficulties to, to understand uh, the medical indication. So I think, as uh, Lu Lucia said before, that it's very important that our hospital are organized to face these problems, uh, to, to have uh, cultural, cultural mediators, uh, uh, to... Um, to, to have re relation with the patient and their families uh, that uh, uh, have really to, to understand the, what the indications are and what uh, uh, they have to do to, to keep the transplant uh, uh, performing uh, for uh, uh, a long period of time. So we have a lot of, of challenges. Uh, uh, I think that the, the today um, event has, has been a, a very important opportunity to start uh, some new initiatives. And I hope and I, I am really available to, uh, to start uh, something new on this field with the diplomacy personnel and, and professionals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Director. And uh, with that, I think we have come to the end of our uh, webinar. So thank you, uh, everybody, for participating and uh, have a good day. Oh, uh, last, uh, please uh, let, let me thank the, my colleague that organized uh, this uh, event. Uh, so I, I will thank Margherita Gentile and Paola Di Ciaccio and Claudia Carella and uh, all the personnel in the National Transplant Center that helped organizing this event. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Massimo, you. Paola, Margherita. And Grazie a tutti. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.